How you doing, everybody? Vada Party here. My guest, John Makovic, a longtime football coach, both in the college ranks and the NFL ranks. And then he took a little time time off to uh, go on this side of the microphone for about four years with ESPN, talking about Wake Forest, Illinois, the University of Texas, and the uh, Kansas City Chiefs and the pros. Again, like I said, and then University of Arizona to close out the college career back in the early 2000s. I missed him by a year. Those that know this show know that I'd spent a year in Tucson. I missed him by a year and got the new regime. But it would have been fun to hang out with him. We met about 12 years ago in in the Palm Springs area, and we've been friends since. We haven't had a chance to talk much, and he's not there anymore. He's in Reno. But with draft day tomorrow and former offensive coordinator, former head coach, he knows quarterbacks, and this is a quarterback-laden draft. So my pleasure to welcome in the uh, coach, John Makovic. John, thank you for the time. How are you? I appreciate it very much. Vasu, I'm uh, pleased to be with you. Talk a little football today. And you're right. This is a draft that has been all about the quarterbacks. And, you know, my first year in Kansas City, it was a draft all about the quarterbacks. 1983. And, yeah. And they're all Hall of Famers. <laughs> Almost all of them are Hall of Famers, too. That's it. So yeah, let's get to this yeah. first. Obviously, the obviously the whole the real world type stuff. Let's get to 2020 a little bit. I was talking with friends of mine that are coaches and broadcasters. You know, we all have routines in this media business, and I'm sure coaches, coaches especially, have routines. You know, you got to do same practice schedule, same all this stuff. You know exactly where it goes. No playbook, no precedent. Unless you read a lot about the Spanish flu, no, no precedent set. How did John Makovic hold 2020 together with his family, not having the control that you used as a coach? Well, 2020 was tough for everybody, and for me. I just had to find things to do. I have never watched so many movies on my <laughs> computer in my life. I watched them. I even watched some of them twice. And surprisingly, I enjoyed them yeah. uh, a great deal. And I did a lot of walking. I had my, I have two artificial hips. Yeah. So when I had my second hip done, I had a little bit of a slow recovery. And so I did a lot of walking. But I watched the weekends during football season. I have not changed. I watch all day Saturday, all day Sunday, Monday night, and I enjoy. Now Thursday nights. Now Thursday nights, yeah. yeah and then Thursday the Mac, the Mac conference last year when there was nothing else. All Mac action on Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights too. So you're there. I mean, you're a true. watching films. That that's a coaching thing. Now you're watching it the second time to see what you missed the first time, like game tape. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's good to have you on. I'm glad you're healthy. I'm glad your family's healthy and everything like that. I know you're in the Reno area now to be closer to your daughter, and that's good. Hope she's doing well as well, too. But let's get to the draft here. Uh, before we get to the actual draft and the nuts and bolts, let's talk about the incumbents here because obviously the San Francisco 49ers a month ago, and you know in that area now you're in Reno, the uh, the their 49er territory, and even when you're in Palm Springs, the Rams and Raiders were not there, so a lot of Chargers fans. Yeah. I was surprised at how many Chargers fans were down there when – when we were down there, they were good. They were in the AFC Championship game the year we met. So that, that's going back a ways, 2008, with the famous Damian Tomlinson with the helmet on the bench, on his head on the bench scene that uh, that everybody criticized him for. Let's talk about, uh, obviously, the 49ers traded a month ago. You should hear talk radio down here. I mean, I'm in the Bay Area. Oh, my God. You think the Giants are playing? I couldn't tell you. You think the A's are playing? I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I think the Warriors are trying to make a playoff spot. I couldn't tell you, John. Every time, and my friend does the 49ers game, Greg Papa, here locally, and he's and they're talking about that every day. Well, he's the team announcer, so you get it. But let's talk about Jimmy Garoppolo for a second, because obviously this trade, he's a lame duck quarterback, because when you have Kyle Shanahan come out and say, we're drafted our starting quarterback, he didn't say 2021, but it's got to be. It's got to be eating at Jimmy Garoppolo a little bit, because what is what did he do wrong? All he did was lead them to a Super Bowl two years ago and you got to think of a mindset and you're a coach. How do you massage a veteran player from a pro standpoint? How do you massage a veteran quarterback knowing he's going to be replaced? That is one of the toughest things any coach will ever have to do. And that is to tell your starting quarterback that he's not going to be the starter or to let, in this case, to tell your quarterback, well, we might, draft another quarterback. Look at what happened with Aaron Rodgers last year. It just about blew up the Green Bay Packers. And a lot of it, or most of it, in my opinion, was not Aaron. And it really wasn't the Packers. It was fans and talk shows and guys like you, Vasu, 
Uh, I have a friend named B. It's unfair. You're bossy, he's B. <laughs> anyway, but that's what it gets into it. So uh, Jimmy G obviously couldn't say much. I admire when the Jets made their move and traded. And, oh, oh who's the quarterback? I'm Sam thinking. Darnold. Sam, you know, I get a little old. That's, we're all there. <laughs> Sam Darnold, Sam Darnold came out and said how much he enjoyed being in New York, how much he appreciated the way they handled him and tried to help him and appreciated how they told him that they were making a trade for him. And I really admired him for that because not everybody feels that way. I wouldn't, I'll tell you personally, I wouldn't feel that way. Uh, you know, no, I get I it. I get it. Totally. Yeah. I'd be like most of them. A lot of them just get up and walk out of the office, bolt. Hey, I'm <laughs> out of here. I don't want to talk to you. It's interesting. Our guest, John Makovic, this is a conversation with I'm Vasi Vataparty. We're powered by Stables Media. We're on Facebook Live. We're on uh, YouTube page, my YouTube page. So if you have any questions, send the questions in. Maybe we'll get a couple of men to John. We got limited time with John today. But uh, with draft day coming in, who better to talk to with, uh, with the perspective that he's got? So let me ask you, let me ask you this. Let's get a little philosophy here. When you're a college coach and you're prepping players, you have a lot of other duties in college in terms of the university, in terms of uh, coaching these players, and you know who the pro guys are going to be from the potential standpoint. How do you coach players knowing that they're going to go to the pros uh, in terms of your scheme? And because you got to win, I mean, you got to keep your job. You got to win, right? That's the number one thing there. Not only raise money for the university, you got to win. And then now you're a pro coach. You're sitting with the Kansas City Chiefs. Now you're going to the combines and you're looking at these same college kids that you were as a coach. How do you balance the philosophy of what these players do? You do you, you bring kids in? I guess my question is: you bring kids into college based on talent and you can work with them for four years because they're so young. And then when you draft, do you draft for need? If you're like a high draft pick, like these top four teams are, or do you, or do you go for the best available athlete, uh, balance that with need as well too? Well, I'll tell you a couple stories. I coached Jeff George at Illinois. Mm -hmm. And Jeff came to me after his second season and said, I'm considering going into the draft. So I prepared a, a whole notebook. The way I went through, I studied everything. And we sat down and we had a great talk. And I told him what I would expect from him uh, if he came back and played. I really thought he could win the Heisman Trophy. He was that good. I remember. Yeah. And we had a really good team coming back. And I believe that we could go, go ahead. And, and I told him, we will do everything we can because you have to promote someone to, to win the Heisman Trophy. And I told him I would do everything we could to help him do that. That would be if he stayed. I also said, if you go, I will understand. And I did. And I was very pleased for him. He had a, a career that I think could have been even a little better. I'm not sure everyone understood him very well, but uh, you know he turned out fine. He's doing fine. On the other side, uh, when we were in the pros and we were looking at whom to draft and everything, uh, my first year in 1983, boy, we had uh, John Elway. Now, remember John Elway told people, I'm not going to the Colts. Right. <laughs> if they draft me, I'll I'll play baseball, but I'm not going. And as it turned out, other quarterbacks were saying the same thing. And I know Dan. I met with Dan Marino personally, and he said, "Please don't don't draft me. I don't want to come to Kansas City. I don't want to play in Kansas City." Now well, I took that into account, but it it's what we needed too. Todd Blackledge, on the other hand said, man, I'd love to play in Kansas City. That's, you know, I'll do whatever, whoever drafts me. And even though we evaluated everybody for what they did and everything, uh, I decided at that time that Todd Blackledge could be our quarterback. And so we drafted him. Well, as it turns out, Danny wound up being in the Hall of Fame and Jim Kelly was ahead and he went into the Hall of Fame. Of course, Elway was in the Hall of Fame. But Todd Blackledge had a solid career in the NFL. And in that particular case, we were drafting for need in right. Kansas City. And in those days, Vasu, 
most teams had the philosophy, the Dallas Cowboys had a philosophy of best player available. Right. Other teams said, well, we need the most needy position. So if there's a quarterback and he's a good quarterback, but we really need a defensive end, a pass rusher, we'll go for the pass rusher. Well, that's you not think the case today. I, I don't see yeah. that today. Today, I think they're looking for the best player they can get, and they'll work everything else around it. John McEvick, our guest here, a conversation with on Vasu Vada Party. Uh, you know, on Facebook Live, Staples Media, YouTube page, our YouTube page, if you have any questions. Wake Forest, Illinois, Texas, Walter Camp Award winner, Coach of the Year, 1979, at your alma mater, Wake Forest. That must have been special. What a class that 83 class was, though, with the quarterbacks, Elway. You mentioned Elway, Kelly, uh, Marino, uh, and, and Todd Blackledge. You know, Todd Blackledge may not have been a Hall of Fame player, but he's a great quarterback at Penn State, and he had a great coach in Joe Paterno. And you know what? I mean, could be controlled by you, too. I mean, he may end up in the Broadcasting Hall of Fame as good as he is. So you can take a little credit for that, too. <laughs> wow. Well, but yeah, don't you think? Don't you think teams – he is very good, yeah. Don't you think teams, the lower you draft, the more you win, your needs are not as much as your as your wants. I, don't you think from 15 down they do draft the best athlete because either they can convert them or they or they fill a plug in a, in, a, in a gap that they need as a secondary player or a backup player or a special teams player or something like that? And that's why you think the athletes are drafted later versus the needs in the top of the draft? Yeah, at 15 down you haven't had a very good year. And so – you're looking oh, 15 to 30. You've had a very good. I'm, I'm sorry. You're right. 15 down. I'm at 15 up to 32. Yeah. Yeah. You're looking to help your team any which way you can help them for those guys. The best teams don't have to pinpoint a hole all the time, but everybody tries to do that. I think today they're, they're looking at next year and the following year. And the, although Today, the draft is who can play today. Uh, if you're a number one draft choice today, you are going to play. They expect you to get on the field and play. And that's the quality of play at the college level, though. The college game is so good today. The athletes are so well developed that they're able to come in and play right away. Do you think that college athletes can come in and play today right away? Because a lot of NFL teams are going to college offenses and spread offenses versus yesteryear when uh, when the college coaches would go visit training camps in the NFL. I'm sure you had a lot of friends in college that would come visit your training camps and, and kind of pick your brain as far as philosophy goes from an offensive standpoint, probably talk to your defensive coaches as well, too, because I see a lot of college offenses out there. I watched Joe Burrow play at Cincinnati last year, and I see LSU. I, it looks like LSU. It looks like coaches are tailoring. And, of course, these coaches are young, too, so they probably are probably looking at a lot of college tape, too, and they say this is the way the offense is going to go with spread offenses. I mean, we were joking that, you know, 49ers and Ravens are probably the only two teams that have a fullback left in the, in the NFL these days. When I was a college coach, I would go study the pros. And when I became a head coach, one of the things I talked about was we will have a pro offense. Wow, that was kind of exciting. You know, <laughs> I'm sure. They like the pros, maybe we'll wind up in the pros. It's completely reversed now. The pros are getting the films from the colleges and saying, gee, this game is pretty neat what they're doing. They throw the ball all over. They still can run the ball some. But the game has totally flip-flopped. And uh, I always encourage college – or I'm, I'm sorry, I always encourage pro assistant coaches who had a chance to go back into college and become a head coach to do it because you could get the experience of the head coaching – that you need. When you get into the NFL, those guys, they're seasoned veterans. And so you need some of that experience. So I encourage co uh, pro coaches to go back into the uh, college game and learn and learn the not only the system, learn how to coach a full team. But so many, so many of the uh, position coaches, you know, are one dimensional. I had a couple of coaches. I had one coach, I won't name him, but yeah. Uh, he stayed in his office by himself and he, he spent no time with the other coaches. He just wanted to do what his little world was all about. Well, 
he was good at it. I will tell you, he yeah, was very good at it. But it didn't help the total team over a long period of time. Okay, one more on the incumbent quarterbacks before we get to this draft here, because I know you're a big quarterback guy, offensive coordinator, and you called your own plays even when you were a head coach. I love Sam Darnold. I thought Sam Darnold was a great prospect coming out of USC. I think I'm not a big fan of the draft itself. I am a fan of the players because the players get excited and they're going into a situation. But every year to me, the draft is basically the same teams that are in the top ten. This is your high point of the year, the New York Jets, the Carolina Panthers, or the Atlanta Falcons. You know what I mean. You see the same teams in the top ten every year. What are you doing differently? And that's what I don't get. Why everybody's going, you know, blank crazy, blank crazy. I won't swear on the air, but blank crazy over everything right now. And I'm like, the New York Jets are the New York Jets are drafting number two. Well, they've drafted number one before. They've drafted number five before. BFD, in my opinion. But here's what I say about that. The Sam Darnold was a great prospect. He didn't have any protection. And obviously the coaching, I mean, not obviously to me because I'm not a head coach and I don't study the film. But you could tell by the record that there was something going on in New York that, that wasn't right. And poor Sam Darnold got beaten up kind of like David Carr did when he came into the expansion for the, for the Texans. And then here's Matt Ryan, a 16-year veteran. If he learned how to play defense, then maybe they would have had more wins instead of being in the number four pick. And, and they're deciding what to do with Matt Ryan, whether to trade him and get more capital and maybe pick up one of these five quarterbacks that's out there. Um, what about Sam Darnold? What about Sam Darnold do you like? I watched Sam in person uh, the year that uh, I did radio for ESPN. We did the USC games all year. So I saw Sam play all his home games. Uh, he was a terrific athlete. And he made so many plays. He he improvised and he broke and he ran and he made big throws. And I thought, wow, this guy, he he can do it. And then when he went to New York, they, they kind of molded him into this pro image of you have to stand in the pocket and stay here. And I, I'm not blaming them or, you know, making any accusations that they didn't know what they were doing. But I don't think they – why are you smiling? <laughs> they, I'm a fair media person, John. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't, I don't think they allowed him to express himself, you might say. Yeah. Scramble a little more. Not that you're trying to – scramble to throw now, Vasu, not mm -hmm. scramble to run. Scramble to throw. Lamar Jackson – is scramble to run, and that's a different model. Sam Darnold wasn't that, but uh, and then of course, if you don't have a team built around him with a defense and you know an offensive line that can help you, look what the Kansas City Chiefs did this year. To they said we're going to win that Super Bowl and we're going to do what we have to do. Forget we don't worry about this draft and all this stuff. We'll go get an offensive line and put it together and look what they've done for their team to make their team a better team. And team now in, in the days when I coached in the NFL, remember we didn't have this free agency like we do today. Yeah. We didn't have the freedom to just go get people back and forth. So it's not different today. Teams are shrewd. They know what they're doing. They, they build some teams build for right now. We're we're going right now. Other teams build for it. Well, it's going to take two or three years. And even though our fans don't like it, if we act this way, we know what we're doing and we're building it. So uh, it, it's a little different game. I actually I I prefer what they're doing today. I say if you can man, maneuver and get your team put together, good for you. Good for you. And if you give up some draft choices, okay. I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm totally into the way the game is today now because there's a lot of flexibility and there's a lot, way, a lot more, a uh, lot more maneuverability, as you said. All right. One more on Jimmy Garoppolo because the, the 49ers were the big news here for the last month. I mean, they made this trade a month ago. Like I said, ever, that's all they've been talking about. They could have done this yesterday and we would have had less time to talk about it based on my feeling of the draft. I'm not even doing a draft show tomorrow, but I am fascinated by the players itself. So one more on Garoppolo. He was three and one with New England as a backup starter for uh, for Brady when Brady got suspended and he was hurt. He comes in the 49ers. He's five and zero with the Niners after they trade for him. They weren't even going to play him that year, but they had to because of need for Kyle Shanahan. So he's eight and one, and then he gets unfortunately gets hurt in that in that game against Kansas City. He's out for the year, and the year goes to 
goes to pot, and then he comes back and leads them to a Super Bowl year where he plays all 16 games. And yet, you would think like the guy is like the guy is like has a 25 passer rating. The way the fan base and the way people are talking about him based on how the Super Bowl ended, I'm going like, what does the guy got to do? And let me, I'm sure you remember. I don't know if you remember quite well, but the uh, I talk about three plays in the in the Super Bowl that had nothing to do with Jimmy Garoppolo that turned around that game. The the penalty by the defensive tackle that didn't get called when he got hit under the chin. I think he got concussed because he missed Kittle and Samuel on two throws. The Sanders throw, I don't know why people are getting all over him for trying to make a 50-yard pass. You know, you know how hard it is to complete a 50-yard pass in a Super Bowl. I mean, with that, with that momentum and that, you know, like, you know, the adrenaline running in you to win a game. And everybody's like, oh, he should have had that pass. He was five. Sanders was five yards ahead of him. Going like, all right, let's get out there and throw a 50-yard pass. And you tell me how you do it. Well, I don't get paid like he does. Well, they're human. And that's what people forget sometimes. That they were the three plays. On defense, they went one on one with Sherman on Watkins. He blew right by him with no safety help. The third and 15 wheel route by Tyreek Hill. Who can cover Tyreek Hill one on one? Anyway, Kansas City proved that last year. And then the uh, and then the Garoppolo hit under the chin that I think he got concussed. He went. He was playing a great game with seven minutes to go in the fourth quarter, and he went two of seven and missed the, and missed the fourth down play because he missed Kittle. That would have given them first down to. Uh, to, uh, to kind of take at least a few more minutes off whether Kansas City got the ball or not. But I think that's where the, that's where the game turned around after he, got, after he got hit and they didn't call the penalty. After they call every other penalty in the NFL for 15 yards, barely touching a quarterback nowadays. Fashu, something strikes me that you are a 49ers fan. I'm a Chicago Bears fan. I'm a Chicago Bears fan, but I live here. Oh, yeah, well. in fact, I'll you tell you a story. You reminded me. I'll tell you a story. I don't know if you played yeah. again. Yeah, you probably didn't in college. You probably know him. So my friend, my very good friend is Doug Plank. I worked some broadcasts with him. He went to Ohio State, played seven years with Bears, number 46, Buddy Ryan's favorite player, the 46 defense, yada, 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 yada. So he, so we're doing the Atlanta 49ers game a couple of years ago when he's in town. And he said, he said, boy, if I played today, I'd be owing the league money for all the 15-yard penalties they're calling. Yeah, well – the, the way they hit the quarterbacks 20 years ago, uh, and I, I really spoke out against it many, many times because I thought it was unfair. If not unfair, it was just, I don't know, what's the right word? It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't in the game of football. No. But in those days, uh, you had to be able to take the licks and just, you know, not say anything and go on your way. Uh, I there are times today when they make some calls and we say, "Oh my goodness, why in the world?" You know, let them play. You know, that's the cry, especially from the defenders. Let us play. Don't don't be tying up our hands. But but the officials work hard to get it right and call it on both sides. And who knows? That's why you know yeah. why people like sports. You know why and and why? Oh, we need to get our fans back so much because no doubt they want they want to see it. People love sports because you don't know how it's going to end every day. That's right. You go to the movies; it ends a certain way. If you go back next week, it ends the same way. <laughs> you go to the opera; they sing, you know, and you go next year, and it's the same opera; they sing it the same way. Not in sports, not in sports. Every day you play, you don't know the final score. That's right. I would have wondered, I, I wonder, just, just before we get back to the draft here, I wonder how you would have handled instant replay as a coach in 21st century football. <laughs> we lost a game in San Diego, and Kellen Winslow caught the winning touchdown pass, and on TV they replayed the catch, but we didn't have instant replay. And so they ruled it a touchdown and he was actually stepped on the line. Right. Okay. I walked in the door that night at home and my, my children were still in grade school. They're screaming, dad, they don't have instant replay. They should have <laughs> had instant replay. Yeah. No, yeah. No, I, no, I, I'm, I'm for instant replay. I don't have a problem with it. I think they should do everything they can to speed it up so the game keeps going. But, yeah, I, I don't object to it. 
Yeah, I think the technology is good. They just got to they just got to keep the pace going. That's the problem is that it takes too long. All right, let's get to the draft. We we spent enough time here on the uh, the incumbents. The NFL draft, obviously, the top four teams: Jacksonville, the New York Jets, San Francisco, Atlanta. Everybody's talking about them and the four picks right now. So, any chance Urban Meyer doesn't take Trevor Lawrence? What do you like about Trevor Lawrence? Because everybody seems to think he's the next John Elway with the with the arm and the. I don't know if he's got the speed. He better take him. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he came out of retirement for, well, right? To take Trevor Lawrence. He better, he better take him or they're going to burn down Jacksonville. That's yeah. what, what do you like about Trevor Lawrence? What do you like about Trevor Lawrence? Uh, big, big time and big plays. And he made big plays when the chips were on the table. He, he's a pressure quarterback. And he does something. I don't like his haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, I have to be honest. Uh, I mean, I don't like his haircut, but right. uh, I'm sure he's not going to cut it because I don't like it. No. Uh, he he makes the plays though. He makes the plays, and and his team believes in him. You know, a, a quarterback can have a lot of skill and talent, but if the players don't really believe, hey, if we get that ball one more time, he'll lead us down the field and we'll win. If they don't believe that, then it doesn't make any difference. So, yeah, I, I think he's the logical pick. I don't discount how good Zach Wilson is. I love Zach Wilson. He's my favorite quarterback after Lawrence, and I'd be, uh, I'd be shocked if the Jets don't take him. That was my next question. Yeah, because here's it, this is your pro this is your pro days when you're drafting mm -hmm. and you've got friends all over the league. So here, here's the way I look at it. Robert Sala spent five years in the – 49ers draft room with Kyle Shanahan. Obviously, he's the defensive side in Shanahan, but they've got similarities. That's why he hired him, right? I mean, you hire coaches that have your similar similar thoughts. You can disagree, but uh, the foundation is all set with similar thoughts. I just got a feeling that Kyle Shanahan's guy was Zach Wilson, but when Sala got the job with the Jets, that I think, oh, well, you know, Shanahan, well, it's not because Shanahan likes him, but it's because that we have similar thoughts in it. I think that's the reason that Zach Wilson got propped up to number two because I really think – I know they're talking about Mac Jones and everything, but that's on the premise that Zach Wilson goes number two for, for Mac Jones. And, and everybody's talking about Mac Jones like he's already a bust because he has a great offense in Alabama. First of all, I don't know why people are judging quarterbacks in year one to begin with because it's going to be unfair to judge them. They're, these guys are going on to bad teams except for the 49ers right now. And it's three, I think I would I, you would agree, and you know better than I – a two-year process, and you see how they do in their third year if they can pick up things and do stuff like that. But what about Zach Wilson? I love Zach Wilson. I think his mobility, mobility is great. He runs the ball. They say that he didn't play anybody at BYU. I disagree with that. And I think his arm is as strong as any quarterback that's out there right now in the draft. When Kyle Shanahan writes his memoirs many, many years from now, you make sure you're around and say, remember that year 2021? Did you call your friend at the Jets and ask to swap picks and you'll give him whatever he wants? Right. Yeah, I agree with you. I believe that Zach is the guy that Kyle Shanahan would have said, that is the prototype of the quarterback that I want. So let's hope that the Jets have someone who can train him and develop him the same way that Kyle might have done in San Francisco. And 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 I'm I'm pulling for I'm I'm a little bit like you. I'm pulling for the players. Yeah. I, I want him to be a good quarterback and to do well. Yeah. And if San Francisco takes uh Mac Jones, I want him to do well. Sure. And I absolutely think he'll get good training. I think he'll get good development. But it all comes around to the total makeup of the team. And if the Jets don't improve other parts of their team, it makes it really difficult for a quarterback to just take care and handle everything. I'll be honest. I haven't seen a lot of North Dakota State. I didn't watch him when Carson Wentz played, and I haven't seen Trey Lance. He's only had the one game that he played two years ago, and their conference didn't play last year. But from what everything, the measure, the quote-unquote, the coach's phrase, the coach speak, the measurables, Say that he's got the arm, he's got the mind, he's got the game, he's got everything that you want in a quarterback, and everybody loves him. And you know, and I love fantasy football, and I love the DraftKings, and I love the FanDuel. But boy, you talk about people that want to be pseudo GMs that go to work every day and spend two hours a night looking at the newspaper or looking at the internet, 
and seeing what everybody says. All of a sudden, boom, you're a GM, and, and they're trying to figure out, we don't want Mac Jones. What, what do you like about Mac Jones? And you think it's fair to say that he had a lot of talent around him and that could come back to come back to haunt him? Or, or, or did that just help them knowing what to do and having a coach like Saban and his offensive coordinator, I guess it was Sarkeesian that was there. Last right. year that helped him a little. That helped him a little bit. And you probably saw his games at USC too when he was coaching as well too. So, tell me about Mac Jones. Tell me what you like about him. I mean, he comes from an Alabama team that's that's always loaded every year, and they've got the best receivers, the best running back. Najee Harris is going to be a first round draft pick as well too. So, was he a complimentary piece in Alabama? Maybe a little bit. But what 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 you what say you, John McAvick, about Mac Jones going to the Forty Nine ers? Yeah, I don't think he was a complimentary piece, but. I, I would have a little question with the lack of playing time that really allowed him to develop everything. And when Tua went to Miami, remember Tua, what did he start, three years or two years at least? Two years, I think, yeah. Two years yeah. and then he got hurt in the senior year. Yeah, he had a lot of playing time. And he was every bit as good as Mac Jones. And yet – he the the talk in the offseason was also in Miami. Do we need to think about another quarterback? Even Tua is he's not exactly a slam dunk in Miami. So uh, I like Mac Jones. I like everything about him. I, I watched some of his workouts when they had him on the uh, NFL Network. Obviously, he had great players around him. I mean, fantastic players. And Devonta Smith, by the way, when anyone's worried about him because he's skinny, just, <laughs> just think about little Tyreek Hill yeah. and those guys playing in Kansas City. Now, remember the Smurfs from the old Absolutely, Washington? From old, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. If you're big or you're fast, yeah. then you overcome just about every – let me put those two up there so you can see them. Yeah, there you go. Those two things, big, physically strong or – Fly like the wind, and that's fast what receivers. Is. Fast receivers. You can't you can't hit what you can't catch. And Tyreek Hill proved that, and Devontae Smith proved that yeah. in his two years at Alabama. Jerry Judy and all the receivers that they had, Henry Ruggs, they had speed all over the place at Alabama. So Nick Saban, the old ball coach, uh, I guess that's Burger's tag, but Nick Saban and the ground and pound in the running game. Uh, apparently, coaches can adapt, and he he figured out that uh, in order to win in 21st century football, you have to throw the ball around a little bit to these receivers. Uh, and he had a really good tight end in that in, in that system as well, too. So, all right, the other quarterback, Trey Lance. I, I don't know much about him. I, I, I obviously what everybody says, what the internet says, and all that. Um, and then who else am I thinking of? The other quarterback, Wilson. Lawrence, we know, is number one. Wilson, Mac Jones, and Trey Lance. What's your impressions of Trey Lance? I did not see any of the workouts. You know, I kind of have this baseball thing that everybody forgets in the Bay Area. The Giants are playing really well right now. and, <laughs> and But it's NFL talk all day until 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, yeah, they want to talk about it. You know, I don't watch the draft a whole lot anymore. It was more exciting when I was in it. But sure, I bet. I watched uh, – I watched – this young guy from North Dakota State. And I discount people who say, well, they didn't play any competition or this or that. Remember that we have had some Hall of Fame and all-time greats who played in some smaller schools. Yeah. And uh, Terry Bradshaw, uh, Brett Favre, you know, some guys like uh, Philip, Philip Sims. You know, those guys are all Hall of, Hall of Famers. Mm -hmm. I watched his workout on TV again. Here's another one I saw workout. I liked everything he did. I liked his th you know, when I when I watch the throwing motions of the quarterbacks, I'm looking for whether or not they're going to be able to throw that deep 25 yard out route on the sideline or comeback route, which is a game saver for him so much, and. If they can't throw that, then they're going to sooner or later, they'll catch up to them. They'll find them. And I won't, again, mention names, but there was a guy who played in San Francisco there who couldn't make that throw very well. And eventually the defense is caught up with him. No doubt about it. Our guest, John Makovic here, former head coach at Illinois, Texas, Arizona, head coach for the Kansas City Chiefs. A broadcaster, which I thought he would have been the next Dick Vitale if he stayed in broadcasting, but uh, he decided to go back into coaching. Did you like uh, 
did you like your we'll, – we'll hit a little bit more football and we'll get into your career a little bit, but did you like yeah. being at ESPN? I know it was tough to go into Bristol and, and all that for the two-day swing, but, but it was blowing up at that time with Myers and Corso and – or I'm sorry, Chris Fowler and Corso. And, and did you get to interact with the other sports and their, and their analysts as well when you were in the building there? Not very much. I tell you, that when you're in that kind of business, well, you are in that kind of business. Yeah. Well, you go to work early and you stay late. And we worked, we did the Saturday night late show. So mm -hmm. we finished about 1 a.m. And yet we would have our first production meeting at nine in the morning. And it was a long day, but I really did like it. And what I used to do once in a while when we had a little break in the afternoon, I would go over and sit in with the guys doing radio. On ESPN yeah, I bet. Radio. yeah, well, they do all and those hits, yeah. They'd have, they'd have all these screens, five, six, seven screens up in different games, and we'd just watch the games, and I'd talk with them about football and everything, and then go back and do the TV gig. So TV, I, TV then was more uh, just cut and dried. Mm -hmm. Today it's more energetic, mm -hmm. more easygoing. I guess we can – thank uh, Charles Barkley and his crew for sort of changing what those shows, studio shows are yeah. like and for the better. Well, you said it, I mean, you're streaming stuff now and everybody's streaming and everybody gets stuff on demand. And so, and so, and then of course, our, you know, in our day, you're a little older than me, but I still remember when it was three networks and PBS and, and you had to wait for Howard's highlights at halftime on Monday night to, mm -hmm. to get all your information versus going to where we met at a sports bar down there in Palm Springs to go see all those TVs that are would have all those games on. So for people that don't understand, and I, I'm fascinated with this because I have friends at ESPN. I have not been to, I've only been there once to, to Connecticut. People don't understand back in the day, maybe in your year, maybe the law changed, but from what I understand, and maybe you know the story, the whole campus is spread out of ESPN in Bristol, Connecticut, right? right? So there used to be an edict on the books that said because it was Bristol, Connecticut, it was small and ESPN came in in the late 70s, early 80s. By the way, it was baseball that got them going at that time, and they were picking up all these college sports, is that they could not have a building over three stories tall in Connecticut in the uh, government. Yeah, in the, in the government rule. So that's why it spread out instead of up. And that's why these guys are running around. All, and you've been on that campus, so you probably walked around. It's probably a long walk all over the campus. But tell people about the studio when you're not on air, where you go in and watch all the games. Is it, it's, it's like 20 TVs there and you're watching every game and, and you're taking notes on everything so you can be pre prepared for halftime and, and pregame shows in the next game, et cetera. Kind of give us a scoop on what's, what the inside media world like from, from inside the war rooms, as they call them. Yeah, producers have a lot to do with what it gets on. Well, not a lot. They basically get everything. And they have their ideas. They're sports fans. They're football mm -hmm. fans. So mm -hmm. they're watching games and they see things which they believe will be interesting to the viewers. And so they sports fans. Right. Sports fans. Watching the game. So they will they will slide the narrative, so to speak. They will slide that in that direction and they'll pass notes a little bit. Oh, you know, this is a this is a really good idea. Now, I remember one time I was doing a game and it was a terrible game. It was like three to nothing at halftime. And we were, when you, co when you come to the studio, you're supposed to talk up the game. And all I could think of was, what I really want to say here is, this is the most boring game I have ever seen. If these two teams don't do something in the second half, I think everybody's going to sleep. But I couldn't say that. So we, yeah, we had, we build them up and boy, let's get this second half going and everything. Because that's our, that's our network. We want fans, right. we want people to stay with the network. But I, I always thought, I wonder what, if I'd ever said that. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, you can always you can always catch it like they do. And those researchers we had, I don't know if you worked with them, but we had Russell Baxter on the other day. Uh, he was at ESPN for 22 years as a researcher. He never got on the radio or TV. And he was given his uh, profootballguru.com as a great website for this generation of, of picking up on the draft. But uh, it always fascinates me, the TV side, because I've never spent a lot of time in TV, but 
behind the scenes I've seen him work and the Fox stuff that I do for baseball is pretty fascinating from that standpoint. People always ask me what you do in those rooms. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. That's not, and you probably appreciate it more when, because you had to deal with it as a coach, but you probably appreciate it a lot more with the work that goes into it when you, when you got there behind the desk and, and in front of the camera. The researchers are fabulous. Nobody can go on radio or television cold and have to do all of the research himself or herself. Uh, those guys, they are fabulous. And at ESPN, they have some of the best. They have some of the best. All right, let's uh, let's get back to the draft here. We kind of div divulged a little bit off the uh, off the subject because I'm always fascinated because I, I still think you would have been a great broadcaster for 15 years and we may have never met in that regard, but uh, but I'm glad we did. Uh, let's talk about a non-quarterback because you're an offensive coordinator. You have to deal with you have to deal with all the other offensive positions. The best athlete in the top ten of the draft that I see is Kyle Pitts, the tight end out of Florida. How would you love to have a tight end that could run like like a wide receiver? Probably could be great on the basketball court at six five or six six, like him from Florida, and be able to throw the ball up high and have him go get it over these five foot ten, even six foot defensive backs that he dominated in the SEC throughout his three years. And it looks like Atlanta may go after him, and, and Matt Ryan may have a candidate. In, in another tight end now down there since they lost a couple of tight ends in free agency the last couple of years. But I am very impressed. I have SEC friends with Kyle Pitts, the tight end. What, what would you have him do as a coach? I mean, you could just salivate at the chance of having a quarterback throw the ball to that guy. I would get all of the New England Patriot and Tampa Bay Buccaneer videos, yes. and I would see what Gronkowski <laughs> was doing and how he was doing it. And I say, now that is what you want to become because Gronk was and is, you know, he caught a pass out of a helicopter. I saw that. Day. Yeah. Guinness Book of Records. Yeah, I did see that. Right. So yeah, that's, I think that coaches like to take credit for inventing things. <laughs> but we, we really steal a lot of things. You know, we see it somewhere. Hey, I like that. Yeah. So what I do, I I would go looking at what Gronkowski had done, and Jimmy Graham. Oh, what a, what a career he has had! I mean, I'd go look at those kinds of guys and say, okay. And then I would try to match up skill sets yeah. because it, one of the worst mistakes that uh, a lot of young coaches make is they see something on film that someone else is doing, and they say, well, we'll just go and do that ourselves. Well. If you don't have the people who do those things, then it won't work the same way. So, yeah, I, I would try to assess, okay, now what does he do well? And and how does that match with what I see in a couple of these best tight ends ever? And then I work with him. And then, of course, you, you want him to have that same thing. The, the thing that separates the, the good players from the great players is what they have inside them. And when when we went to the draft and we wanted to find out about people, especially the higher up the draft, you know, you're drafting in the top first 10, five to 10 yeah. pick. You want to know what kind of heart they have. I mean, you want to know, can we count on this person when things are really tough to get things done? And not only a quarterback, but at these other positions as well. Well, you mentioned one of my favorite tight ends growing up in Southern California, watching Kellen Winslow. Uh, oh, it, you kind of, yeah. I mean, talk about an athlete and talk about a guy. I mean, he was way ahead of his time. Him and him and Russ Francis, I guess, were the gold standards in those days when I was a kid watching watching NFL football. All right, this is why I like doing my type of interview show because it's not nuts and bolts and oh, here's who we are going to take at one. Now, I'm no Mel Kiper and I'm all I'm not this and that, but I am interested in the players type of thing. So let's take a look at the draft board here. I got the draft board up here. Jacksonville, New York, okay. San Francisco, Atlanta. Any team in the top 10, and I, I'll give you mine if you want first, but any team in the top 10 that interests you in terms of, and it could be any of the 32, but I put the top 25 up here. Any any team in the top in the top 10 or anywhere in the draft that you're interested in what they're going to do as far as a draft standing, maybe New England at 15 or, or, or uh, even Dallas at 11 now that they're going to get Prescott back and Sean Lee retired on their defense. They have to improve their defense. Even Tennessee, what they're going to do, they gave up a ton of points last year. So I'm interested 
my two teams I'm interested I'm interested to see what New England does based on what Cam Newton had last year and he's got to get a front seven again because they had no pass rush last year and I think that that hurt them and I don't know I mean he could you could end up seeing Bill Belichick end up making a trade maybe moving up in the top 10 to go get a quarterback because I think he likes these quarterbacks that, that are out there and then the other one that I'm fascinated with is the Denver Broncos because they have a defense I know they don't have Von Miller but I love the Denver Broncos Drew Locke is okay I don't know if he's had enough time to develop Nick Fangio's a defensive guy. Maybe he has the wrong coordinators or something like that. Uh, I hate to see some of these guys end up in the Alex Smith situation. And I'm I'm biased to Alex because he lived around here and I got to hang around with him when he was with the 49ers. But you can't be successful with six coordinators in seven years. And I think that was a knock on him. And then, But he was such a team guy that he helped Kaepernick and he helped Patrick Mahomes. And you want guys like that on your team too. But, but I think people think that he didn't get the most of his talent. And I'm going – a lot of times it's not his fault. I'm not knocking you coaches. I'm just saying that that's management and things change, and that's just the pro game these days. Well, it's always been the game. It's always been the game. Alex Smith. But six coordinators in seven years, John. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. That, that, that will wear anybody out. He will be remembered and should be remembered, and they ought to have a plaque or a, some kind of award named for a guy like him. They, she should name, he should be he should have the comeback player of the year named after him now. That they should. Yeah. Alex Smith comeback player of the board. Uh, that'd be a good idea. Why don't you float that somewhere? All right. Here you are got the, the contacts. Teams. I'll send it to you. <laughs> here are the two teams that I uh, when when you said pick a couple teams. Well first of all Dallas I always like to follow because I coached there a couple of know. years. We'll get you know, a little bit. We'll talk about your career in a little bit. Yeah, I know Jerry Jones. And Dallas always seems to come up with a surprise. <laughs> and then the other one for me is Denver. And it has to do with Drew Locke. And how? what are they going to do to get their quarterback situation and their offense solidified so that they can move forward because they are just, they're this close to being where they need to be, but they can't be, you can't get there if you don't decide what you're going to do at quarterback. And the game today, Basu, the game today is all about the quarterback. You know, 20 and 30 years ago, if you missed out on a quarterback, it was sort of like, Oh, well, okay, well, maybe next year we'll get, oh, yeah, sure, there's a great player there. We know that, but not everybody gets one, a quarterback like that. So let's get a good runner. Let's get a good a runner and, and let's, you know, be, everyone needs to build defense. But it was, it was more about the run game and balance. Let's have balance. Today, they don't care about balance. Let's throw that thing. Let's chuck it around there. And let's get going. And so the quarterback is what's – and that's why it's getting all the attention this year. It'll get the same attention next year. Quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. Our guest, John Makovic, former head coach at Illinois, Texas, Arizona, and the Kansas City Chiefs, an All-American at Wake Forest. We didn't even get a chance to talk about his career. We'll talk about his uh, his athletic career. Very interesting fact when I did my research today. But uh, I'm interested in the draft. I appreciate you doing this uh, on the draft side. you got a few more minutes. I'm going to take a quick break here and we'll talk a little bit about you and what you got going, what you got going these days. Cause I want to bring up a couple of things that I saw in your career that I think, uh, I think people should know about here. Give me 30 seconds. Our All mics right. will go out. You're watching the a conversation with John Makovic. I'm Vasi Vada party back in 30. Welcome back to our conversation with John Makovic, former head coach of the University of Illinois, Arizona, Texas, and the Kansas City Chiefs. Had a long, distinguished career. He's an All-American in Wake Forest and then was an assistant coach, grad assistant. He spent even a year in my alma mater, San Jose State, way back yes, when I did. saw that. I forgot about yeah. that. I forgot about that. Two years in San Jose State. Yeah, I think that your Wikipedia page is wrong. You're going to have to correct it. I know. I know you're big on the Internet these days. How do you like the Zoom stuff? How do you like doing conversations like this now? 
Zoom is wonderful for my family too. We can connect everybody and like on a Sunday afternoon and we get a chance to visit and talk. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, it's good. It's it's good to see and we're, you know, we're able to do shows like this as well too from our offices and all that. All right, let's talk a little bit about your uh, your background. Barberton, Ohio, which I don't know where that is. My dad went to Ohio State, so I don't know where Barberton is, but you get recruited by an assistant coach. According to what I read, you're not, you weren't recruited heavily, but you got recruited out of Barberton, Ohio, because there was an assistant coach at Wake Forest that was from Barberton. Dick Hunter, That's I right. guess, was his name, right? Okay, so you're, you're going to be impressed with my research by the end of the show. I am impressed already. Now, I do have to make one correction. Uh, I was an academic All-American at Wake Forest. Good for you. Not a regular. In my in the backfield with me, you know this, was a guy named I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me set it up. Let me set it up. Let me set it up here. So okay. you were roommates. You were roommates, and those we're going to lose about half our younger generation here by the movie. But uh, <laughs> Brian Song with Billy D. Williams back in the day. Talk about smooth back in the day. Uh, he's still smooth in his 80s. And uh, and uh, was it James James Kahn played Brian Piccolo in the movie 1971 movie Brian's Song. Well, I did not know this until I was doing research today uh, that Brian Piccolo. And if you ever get a chance to watch that movie, it's a great movie, a true story about Gail Sayers and Brian Piccolo, especially in the 60s, black and white, uh, black and white uh, race relations type thing, especially with what we're going through today. It's a great measure of love and respect uh, across the board in terms of race relations. But the reason we brought that up and he brought it up and I'm setting it up for him. Brian Piccolo of the famous Brian song died of can't leukemia, right? It was leukemia? Yeah, uh, it was prostate cancer. Prostate cancer. Okay, so he died of prostate cancer. They made a movie, this Brian song about the love, about basically it was a love story of, of two people that uh, really fell for each other in terms of their different backgrounds. So, but Brian Piccolo was, an, was at Wake Forest. He was running back at Wake Forest, and he was a roommate of my guest here, John Makovic at Wake Forest. I never heard that story. So you guys were friends. You guys lived together. And then he went to the Bears, and uh, he went to the Bears. You probably kept up with him in your coaching trails, and you probably stayed in touch with him. So how did this all – I mean, not how did it come about. I know it came about. You both got recruited from school. But how did your friendship stay after college until, until his untimely passing? Well, I I went in the army, and he went to the Chicago Bears. I'm not sure which one worked out better. In it those was days, v I don't know. Yeah, that yeah, was Vietnam at that time, and we we passed you know notes back and forth, but not we didn't have a lot of uh, attention. Then I came out to California to San Jose, mm -hmm. and so I was even a little farther away from him and everything. And I remember when I was told how sick he was. Uh, I wrote a letter to him and his wife, Joy, wrote back and said how grave the situation was. And she didn't know how much longer Brian would, would last. And sure enough, he died very shortly after that. So uh, he, what a wonderful guy he was. I tell you, he was fun. And he he loved to play the game. Yeah. We played everything together. We played football. Then we played intramural basketball. Then baseball. We played all the sports together. We hung out together. And he was he was a he was a real pro as a friend. Besides being a real pro as a football player. Yeah, it might not have been the most talented, but I think a lot of coaches would love to have a player like that because of the dedication he gave. And unfortunately, untimely passing. Do you watch the movie still when it comes on? Do you find yourself just Whatever you're doing, all of a sudden you'll sit down for a few minutes and watch. I didn't watch the movie for about the first five years. Oh, okay. Just, I just uh, didn't want it. Just, it just I didn't feel out. good. Then I watched it and I thought, oh, okay. But I, I haven't seen it for a long time. Yeah. 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 Well, like I said, if you get a chance to watch it for those watching and listening on our on our uh, on our oh, podcast, yeah. go get a chance to watch it. All right, last one. You mentioned the Dallas Cowboys, so I want to work this. I mentioned Doug Plank earlier. So you were, you were a quarterback coach in 1981 after your stint at Wake Forest. Uh, by the way, how great was that to be named a head coach of your alma mater when they offered you that job? That must have been a thrilling day for you. Yeah. Everyone told me, don't take it. <laughs> <laughs> All you did was win coach of the year and improve that team in two years. Yeah. But Wake Forest football, and I want you to give Wake Forest football today a lot of credit. They, they have a coach named Dave Clausen yes. who's done a wonderful job there. 
and I follow them very closely. Yeah, I bet. And they had that one year where they went 10-0 and and they beat a bunch of teams that year. And I, I can't remember what year that was. I want to say 2008 or 2009 that uh, Jim uh, – uh, what was his name? Jim uh, – Jim Grove. Yeah, Jim Grove. Yeah, yeah, Jim Grove. Yeah, took that team undefeated, and they were they were really good. Uh, so you he did were assistant it. coach after your Wake Forest days. You went to you went to the Dallas Cowboys. Tom Landry – I mean, how does that conversation go? Does Tom Landry call you himself, or does Tom Landry call – you must have had an agent. You're a head coach. I don't know if you had an agent back in those days. No, but. we didn't have it. We didn't have it. <laughs> no representation. All right, then you got underpaid. So how does this conversation go? Tom Landry calls you on the phone and says, well, "Hey, we like." What you go ahead. Yeah, it was March. We were on spring break, and the phone rang, and my wife was on the phone, and she said, "You will never guess who just called me." Or no, I take it back. I called her and said, you will never guess who just called me. She said, Tom Landry. I said, why would you say Tom Landry? <laughs> she said, I don't know. That's just who I thought was calling. <laughs> sure enough, he had called me that morning and said that Dan Reeves was leaving and going to the Denver Broncos. And would I think about maybe being the quarterback coach? And he said, you know, think about it. I, I'm going to the league meetings. We'll be in Hawaii for a week or 10 days and I'll call you when we come back. And so they called and the guy named Gil Brandt yep. was very instrumental in doing a lot of the legwork and really probably did more to help me in my career. In fact, not probably he did. Gil Brandt deserves credit for helping so many coaches advance and get an opportunity to be found, so to speak. So anyway, Coach Landry called me and I went to Dallas and it's kind of neat, but you know, I spent some time with him. We talked a little football. Yeah. He wanted to know about me and this and that. And then he he asked me if I'd have breakfast with a friend of his. And I said, Yeah, fine. And the next morning this gentleman came to breakfast. It's kind of interesting. It wasn't a coach. And so he, after it was over, he said, can we go upstairs? And we went upstairs and he said, could you take this little test? Uh, it's a quick little test here. I thought, yeah, well, it's the wonder lick. Yeah. Okay. So they're giving it to coaches. <laughs> <The Wonderlic too. laughs> so at that, I thought, oh, wait a minute. Why do they want me to take the wonder lick? I said, okay, so I raced through that zip, 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 and, uh, oh, I don't know. That, that academic All-American in you slipped right through as it. As fast as I could get through it, and I handed it back, and I said, look, I skipped I skipped the, one of those there. Uh, I just didn't want to go back to it, so that's it. Anyway, I took the test, and yeah. you know, Coach Landry said, well, we'd like to have you come. Why don't you? go home and think about it and call me tomorrow. I called him that night mm -hmm. <laughs> and said, coach, I, I don't have to think about it anymore. Yeah. I'd love to come and be with the Cowboys. Those two years were wonderful. I, I really loved being part of the Cowboys and who they were, what they were. They were such a class organization. And of course we had a really good team too. You had a really good team. Both years in the championship game. Right. That was the that was the that was one of the reasons I brought this up because I remember it very well. But also, um, you know, not a lot of people knew who Tom Landry was. I mean, not not the person himself, and that mm -hmm. kind of fascinating because he had that stigma, and you see that famous NFL films uh, silhouette of him with the hat, and uh, just kind of the thing. He passed away in two thousand, about three weeks after my dad did. Uh, so I remember all the stories, and you know, I don't know. Some people think it was unceremonious of how he got let go. But I think at that point in time, I think Jerry Jones ran the team. And so and you, you said, you know, Jerry Jones, and he wanted to kind of kind of change it over from the old days to what it became. But what kind of man was, I mean, uh, behind the scenes, off camera, what kind of man was Tom Landry in terms of, in terms of just like, seemed like he was just a true down to the earth, down to earth, like religious and, and, you know, just like straightforward type of guy that you knew where you stood with him, like right away. He was, fair, honest, considerate, warm, but could be pretty chilly too. 
<laughs> and I was young and, you know, I would come in and I'd say, oh, I thought of this play, this play. I know we can get a touchdown on this play. And he'd look at me and say, John, we tried that play two years ago and it didn't work. We tried it again last year and it didn't work. And it won't work this year either. <laughs> but did he call his own plays? You were the quarterback by title. You were the quarterback coach. And right. I know you have to have meetings for the week. He called his own plays. So he's the inventor for those that are watching college football that are younger in the younger generation. Everybody's in a shotgun nowadays and everybody's running five receivers and all that. This is the uh, invention of Tom Landry in the seventies, right? Yeah. He, he, we called it the spread. The passing shotgun, the passing shotgun, yeah. not the running, not the running right. one. Yeah. We called it the spread. Mm -hmm. and so I always called it the spread after that is kind of a, an honor uh, of him. We never called it the shotgun. I, we, uh, I said, no, this is in tribute to Tom Landry. We'll call it the spread. Nice. And I always had an oval huddle in memory and honor of Paul Brown, because I grew up uh, in Barberton, which is just 30 miles from Cleveland. Okay. And the Browns were my team. Otto my team. Yeah. Nobody today knows who uh, Otto I know who Otto Graham is. Yeah, I know. Probably the greatest winner. Yeah, that was my hero. That's who I wanted to replace was Otto Graham. So those two things I always had uh, with my team. One is the huddle and one was the spread. Yeah. So you're in Dallas and you're coaching. Uh, 1981 reminds me because we moved to the Bay Area in 1981. And here you are coming off an NFC championship game uh, the year before. And then now the Dallas Cowboys are the year before. And now you're coming into San Francisco to play the 49ers who had this young quarterback in Montana and this young coach from Stanford, three years in the league, running his uh, quote unquote West Coast offense, which you see everywhere now, 25, 30 years later, not only the offense, but the coaches and the disciples from it. So what were your impressions preparing for that game then? And then what did you see or what did you know about Bill Walsh? You probably knew him a little bit in college, but what did you know about Bill Walsh and Joe Montana and how how you had to prepare for their defense, which was very underrated in those days. By the way, yes. that was the that was the Ronnie Lott, Dwight Hicks, Carlton Williams, and Eric Wright defensive back, the three rookies and Dwight Hicks, and uh, they kind of took it to you guys a little bit. And then Montana made that pass at the end, and he says he was thrown away. And Dwight Clark went up, Dwight Clark went up and got it. I met Dwight Clark who passed away, and and they've got a nice book out that the one of the local writers did about him about oh he drew that drew that play up in the dirt and all this other stuff and Harvey Martin. And him and Montana were talking as Montana went to the ground and didn't see the touchdown pass. But what a year that was and what a game that was. And it kind of, you guys kind of helped San Francisco get on the map in terms of that game. No, we didn't help them. They, they did it themselves. Now go back and look, they beat us. During yeah, this they season, did. And they beat us pretty soundly too. It was a game that we did not play very well. And they didn't you beat them in the regular season? Didn't you really hammer them in the regular season and they came no. back and beat you in the NFC championship game? No, they beat us. Oh, they during... beat you. Oh, they beat you. Okay, I had it wrong. Okay. And they and I think that really helped them believe, hey, wait a minute. We can we can play yeah. with these boys. Yeah. Yeah. I, the gold. Game. I was standing right there on the sideline. I I wish you wouldn't bring it up. <laughs> I had to bring it up once. I'll never bring it up again. Yeah. <laughs> But you're in 49er territory now, so I mean yeah, that started that run. And Bill Walsh is Bill Walsh is uh, you know Bill Walsh considered one of the greatest coaches, and Dwight Clark and and Ronnie Lott and all those Hall of Famers that they had. But what a game that was! And again, from a broadcasting standpoint, this goes back. I'm getting failing half half the audience right now, but uh, uh, baseball announcers because I'm a baseball guy. Vince Scully and Tom Brookshire calling on TV. Jack Buck and uh, uh, Jack Buck and Hank Stram doing the radio. I mean that's that's the football guys. That's legendary in itself. But you talk about yeah. two of the great broadcasters and Vince Scully and Jack. They don't talk to assistant coaches very much in these production meetings. But you ever get a chance? To, I mean, you went into broadcasting, and now you and like I said, you respect from the other side. But did you did you did you ever get a chance to talk to some of these legendary guys like Summerall and Madden and all that? Probably when you were a head coach, you talked to them a lot more. Yes, when I was a head coach, I don't think I ever got to talk to them when I was an assistant coach. Yeah, that's probably a Landry thing. That's a Parcells thing. He never let his assistants talk to anybody as well, too. All right, John, I appreciate the time here. Oh, one other thing about the Dallas thing was uh, yeah. you had Landry and the state face and the silhouette, and then you're there as the assistant coach as a young guy, 
And then I bring up, you know, I'm a Chicago Bears fan, and you had this wild and crazy guy. You had the curly hair then, and he's on the staff. Mike Ditka is there as assistant coach. So after 1981, you go to Illinois. He goes to Chicago Bears to work for uh, to work for the team that he played for, Papa Bear House. And Doug Plank, like I said, was one of his players at the time. Buddy Ryan was the coach. But you guys coached together in 81. What did you like about him, and what did you think about him? I don't know how well you knew him before then, but when you got to Dallas, he played there and then Landry out into the staff. So just thought that uh, just thought that you might find some recollections on him as, a, as an assistant versus how he was a player because ABC would focus on him all the time with the gum and the yelling and all this other stuff. And I'm just kind of thinking if he was that way as an assistant coach, too, that didn't get the cameras. Mike was Mike. And let me tell you, Mike was a brilliant football coach. Most people saw him the way, you know, he exerted everything right. and, and and they thought, well, he just must blow up and yell and scream. Now, Mike was very solid, everything. I really enjoyed working with him. We had a nice friendship. Uh, and, I was going to ask you that because you went to Illinois and he went to the Bears at the same time. Right. Did you keep in contact for the times uh, through the yeah, years? Actually, I went to Kansas City. Oh, you went to Kansas City. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought, okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, and we would see each other at the NFL meetings and things. Oh, yeah, we always had dinner and didn't think. Yeah, Mike and I had a good friendship. I really, I respected him. But that sometimes when you say, well, I respect him, that's kind of a, you know, a lower accolade. Especially in front of a camera. You don't want to say anything bad about anybody in front of a camera. (laughs) No, I really, really liked Mike. And Mike, like I say, Mike's a brilliant football coach. Yeah, no doubt. So much, but what made him even better was his fire. Yeah, he no had- doubt. I mean, I grew up as a Bears fan in the seventies, watching Peyton and and I guess Jack Pardee was coaching when Plank was there in the seventies. But uh, but the Bears have always been my team. And when they got that Super Bowl, and he let the players be the players. But when it came to game time, boy, that defense tore it up. And Walter Payton was great, and uh, and McMahon. You know, McMahon kind of. Kind of, kind of. I think McMahon kind of is a Dicka type of guy, even though they probably didn't get along very well. They didn't agree on everything. They got along really well, but they didn't agree on everything because you got one way, and then you got Ditka from the old school ways and stuff like that. But uh, that brings me to the last, the last, the last thing here before I let you go. And I appreciate. It. I know I kept you on a lot longer than I said I would, but I have so much fun talking to you, and we haven't talked in a long time. So I think everybody should know what kind of career you had on top of the fact that it's draft tomorrow. So I appreciate it in advance before we say goodbye, but uh, do you think coaches, when you were coaching, and I don't know how to phrase this right, because it's, it's a different mentality nowadays in terms of in terms of a partnership versus coach versus player then in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Do you think coaches adjust the players and their talents more today, and or was it just understated back then because there were less cameras and less media and less social media? out there where it's like a partnership then or a partnership now between coach and quarterback or coach and player. Uh, how was it like that for you when you were coaching in the seventies and eighties? Well, I'm old school. <laughs> so yeah, uh, not people would say, well, it's his way or the highway. That That's not really uh, an accurate term for us guys who are a little older and everything. Right. But I'm first of all, I, am not in favor of the players deciding whom the team should draft. Number one, I, I agree with that. There's these quarterbacks saying, well, it's, you know, I have an invested uh, you know, investment in this team and I want to be involved with who we draft. Well, no, no, you're a player. This is what you do. And, and we respect all of that, uh, but we're going to, we need to build the team in a way that we feel is best for the team. So in that regard, things are about the same, should stay the same. But, well, we've changed. We've just changed. Everything's changed. I don't know if it's always for the better. No. It's changed, and coaches are more accountable today than ever. And I'm not sure – I'm not sure that – Everybody would like to be a coach today. They all like, you know, when most guys like to be head coach on pay. They're winning. No, <laughs> on on payday, payday. Right, on payday. <laughs> yeah. Players too, for that matter. And the players too. They like it on payday. Uh, and they like if they're winning. Sure, you. everybody wants to win. But remember what we said from the very beginning. If you're in sports, 
every game, every day, there's a winner and a loser. And you can't determine that on your own. You, you're not like a movie set where you can do it over. Hey, cut, cut. Let's redo that scene. No, you have to take it the way it comes. Like it's like you said with movies, you know the ending as opposed to sports where you don't know the ending. Last mm -hmm. thing for me here, and then I'll let you go, is uh, how would how would how would John McAvick of old school days, the players, the player, the coach, you I'm sure you took input from players on certain things. I mean, you have to be a team and you have to listen to what your players say, especially in the pro ranks, like maybe not so much in the college ranks in those days. So now we we're not ABC, NBC, CBS, and you were at ESPN, so you know it was just getting big. ESPN was blowing up with all their stuff now. Now they've got six networks: the ACC, the SEC, Big Twelve, Big East. Longhorn Network is even their own network. I'm sure probably keep up with the University of Texas, having some ties there too. How would you how would you handle not just the regular media, but all the but all the other all the other jabbers out there, for lack of a better word, the talkers? Like we're doing a like I'm not a real like credential type of guy but i mean i work for a network but these are the way we're doing interviews now social media i guess and some of the things you say everybody's a little sensitive at some point it's very easy for people to get on camera and say oh we don't read anything or we don't do anything but here we are in the 21st century and this is all part of it and and i understand college coaches are a lot different than pro coaches because you can actually coach in the pros a lot more obligations you have college boosters and and your assistant coaches are more valuable, I, th I think, in my opinion, just from watching that they do a lot of the coaching and the head coaches in college have to do a lot of stuff. So from that regard, take take 1980 or to 2021, here you are with social media and here you are with the bloggers and the vloggers and the and everything that's out there and everybody's coming at you from all sides. Like I can I can probably post 300 things right now about who's going to draft where tomorrow. And, and they could all be wrong, but you know what I mean? And how would you handle all this stuff with all the media that's out there? Good and bad. I don't know. Long ago, I remember when I was at Texas and we had a couple of these social media types and they were, in my opinion, of course, <laughs> my opinion counted for me, uh, they were pretty brutal. And I remember meeting with the uh, – the athletic director and our president. And they were getting these calls and these things put on the internet and everything. And they wanted to talk to me about, you know, what is going on? And I said, well, you're getting one side of this yeah. story. And I said at that time, and this was 19, 1993 or four. So how this many? When you're in Texas, I missed that part. This is when you're in Texas. 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 1993 okay. or 94. I said, "Do you know what we need to do?" And they said, "What?" I said, "We need to have our own people <laughs> there you to go. our stories yeah. for us." Well, what do you think we're doing today? That's exactly right. PR people, people media relations Twitter. people. It's huge yeah. nowadays. Everybody has a communications team that's helping to tell our side of the story. So, but I believe it was something that had to be done because what was happening was our fans were getting one side of the story and they should at least get both sides. Then they can decide, hey, we read about him here and we read here and we think you stink anyway. Okay, <laughs> but at least we got a chance to say, you know, we're using deodorant. Yeah. <laughs> Well, when you're in the NFL, you have a you have a brotherhood of coaches, and so it's easy to communicate. But I'm fascinated by this, and I know we talked about the draft. And John McAvick, by the way, our guest, and he says he says Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Mac Jones, and Kyle Pitts. It's put it in stone for tomorrow. For John McAvick, the old football coach here. When you were in college, and I find this fascinating because you know I'm I'm a big academic guy, and I love college. And you know, if I didn't get my education, my dad would kill me because he was a PhD electrical like engineer at Ohio State. And education was a big thing. He could care less if I played ball. He could care less if I spoke English as long as my math skills did, because that's an engineering deal from India. That's just mm -hmm. the way it goes. But when, the interaction in college, because football is the money-making sport, football and basketball are the money-making sport. How important is it for a college coach? Because I see it more now. Did you interact? Because when you were at Illinois, you had Lou Hansen there. I think he was there at that time as a yeah. basketball coach. And, uh, you know, and other coaches there, would they come to you or would you support the – 
the other sports by going to their events and things like that. And I think when you were at Texas, Tom Penders was there, if I'm not mistaken, the time frame. So, man, my memory is still good, John. And you should thank yeah. me on that. You should send me a note on that. Uh, Better than mine. <laughs> well, you remember me. That's the most important thing. And you stayed on longer. And you stayed on longer than you, than you expected to. And I really appreciate that. But how important is it? Because the universities rely on football and college. And, well, we went through a 2020 and the fact that they played because the universities needed the money. And it's all about the dollars. We, we all know nowadays. Um, how was the interaction with the, with you amongst the other coaches on, in the athletic department? Because I, I find that to be a very interesting dynamic because sometimes you can get the jealousy because they're not making any money and they have to scrap for their, they have to scrap for their fans and they have to, you know, sell new raffles and stuff like that to make money. And then the football team has made Texas. I mean, Texas is a byproduct, but uh, all the money they make, but did you have good relationships with all the other coaches at the universities that you were at? I try, yeah, I tried to, if I were in town, I never missed the basketball game at home. Uh, that was the. I really like basketball. Yeah. And if I if I were in town, I would be there. And I went to lunch with different coaches uh, who became friends. We just talk about things and what they do, how they do it. Uh, so at least I tried. I think most of the coaches on the staff felt that we had a good friendship, and I never felt that coaches from sports that didn't generate the kind of money that football generates. I, I never felt that they were jealous of that. I, most of the time they understood, okay, all they wanted was a fair shake. The greater good. Yeah. If they were, if they were getting shortchanged because football was getting it, they'd be, yeah, right. they would, be upset. but I tried to back them as much as I could always. The famous relationship between Bill Parcells and Bobby Knight, football and basketball, kind of co uh, kind of coexisting there. And the reason I brought that up is not because of them, but also because I find it very fascinating because I'm more of the psychological type, even though I never took a class in psychology. I'm like, do coaches do coaches get ideas from other coaches from other sports? Not about the team, not about the sport itself, but in terms of how to how to handle players and how to deal with players. You must have asked, you must have been asked for advice on how to deal with with players in certain situations or, or just overall philosophy. I'm sure that goes on, especially at universities, because you just can't, you just, you, sometimes you have to go outside the box to, to think about how to, how to get your players going, especially in a college setting. I think I did more asking than they did. Yeah. And I really enjoyed listening. But you think that's fair? You think coaches do that? You think it's a good idea to go outside of your sport and kind of get philosophies from other sports and other avenues? Sure. Yeah. Because when it comes to handling, working with people, it makes a difference. Uh, you know, one of the guys that I really enjoyed at when I was at Texas was our track coach. And we went to lunch frequently. And I just like, well, I liked him as a friend, as a person, but I, he would tell me how he trained and what he did. And we also had the swimming coach at Texas who just retired the greatest swimming coach ever. Yeah. And he loved hunting ducks, shooting ducks. And he would talk about shooting ducks and then someone would bring up the swim. Oh yeah. Swimming. Yeah. Well, but let me tell you what I did this morning. I was out there in the bluff. And uh, you know, so I, I enjoyed hearing about their life, yeah. their teams and what they were doing. Oh, you're a people person. Uh, last thing here, I promise this is the last thing, is uh, you 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 went to Wake Forest, you played there, uh, you you got named as a coach at your alma mater. That must have been exciting. And then I put up here, uh, 1995, that must have been a great day. Your alma mater and you coach there, you get inducted into the Wake Forest Hall of Fame. Now you're up there with, uh, I think the most two famous most athletes that I know are Chris Paul and Chris Paul and Tim Duncan from Wake Forest. But uh, but. What was that day like to be inducted into your alma mater and, and being recognized as one of the greats of Wake Forest? You missed Arnold Palmer? I missed Arnold Palmer. I'm doing this from memory. I'm doing this from memory, John. Actually, I didn't know that he went to Wake Forest. I forget because a lot of golfers, they go to college, but nobody talks about it because they, they leave for the pros too early. Well, in those days they did. Uh, nowadays, most of the kids who go to Wake Forest stay their four years, get a degree. This new uh, Will Zalatoris who uh, yep. made a Love him. Nice mark for himself at the Masters. 
most of the kids at Wake stay and finish. Being, being inducted into the Hall of Fame of one's university, no matter where it is, is a very special day, and it was an honor. And my daughter was in school at Wake Forest there at the time. Nice. She also went to Wake, and so it was, it was a great day and a great evening for our whole family. Something you'll cherish for the rest of your life. Well, yeah. I pre I appreciate the time. I know I kept you on an hour and 20 minutes. It wasn't planned this way, but I, I did want to get your opinion on the draft because I know you know quarterbacks and I know you know the NFL and I know you watch every weekend because that's how I met you. We were sitting there all day on that Saturday and Sunday. You I don't know if you I don't know if you remember the actual day that the day that my then girlfriend and I we showed up. She got mad that I spent more time with you that day, but I was learning so much that day for me. It was the day. The Chargers and Patriots played. I talked about the Tomlinson sitting on the bench with the helmet. And then right. we watched Brett Favre's last game as a Packer when the Giants won. And the first year, and somewhere in the conversation after a little adult beverages is when I said, oh, I like to bet on these games. And I said, I went 2-0 today, Coach Makovic. How do you like me now? <laughs> well, we had a great day that day, and I'm so glad I kept in contact with you. You look great. You're 77. I'm, I think if I read that right. 77, yep. you look great. You're in great health. The best to your family. Uh, stay in touch. You know, I come up to Reno periodically. I'll give you a call and we'll chat. Uh, and hopefully around training camp, we'll do this. And uh, I really appreciate the time, John. Anytime, Vasu. I'm headed to the golf course this afternoon. Okay. Well, I don't want to keep you from tea time. So hang on for a okay. second. Thanks to everybody on Facebook Live and YouTube channel. Uh, if you miss any of the live broadcasts, you can download and subscribe at Apple or Spotify or anywhere you get your podcast powered by Stables Media. Conversation with John Makovic on Boston Vada Party. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you again soon. Take care.